Yeah. Um, you know, well, I was talking to uh, Steve Arrington recently from Slave, and he was saying how Steve Washington and that band, you know, guys, the musicians were phenomenal, like a Mark Adams on bass and those guys. But he said that Steve Washington added a lot to that because of the way he would have them record their parts. Um, was there anyone in Cameo, was it Larry or someone else that kind of, you know, looked out for the sounds and, and how they came across and kind of added anything in that area? Oh, yeah. For example, uh, the snare drum in Word Up was not necessarily a snare. It was a combination of claps and different electronic sounds that culminated into that one sound that was repeated in commercials and other songs. And I mean, we've had, <clears throat> we've had many uh, musicians comment on that sound, like, wow, where'd you guys come up with that snare sound? But even back then, we would experiment with different things. Now, what I loved about recording back then, we would all record at one time, and then, you know, you'd overdub certain parts, you know. But the basic tracks were all recorded in one room with everyone. Uh, and, you, you know, a guy, a guy would do a bass part over, or, you know, we'd overdub guitars and things like that. You know how it goes. <clears throat> But it was, uh, Larry was really a great producer in that he would search out different sounds and not just a bass sound would, you know, we'd filter that through something else or there would be a, a guitar part that wouldn't even sound like a guitar part. You think it was a keyboard part or something. So in those instances, that was something that uh, I think kept us fresh and kept, kept the music fresh. For sure. So um, moving into the 80s, which was a big uh, transition for a lot of folks, Cameo released uh, two albums again. And um, if you look on here, uh, there's The Secret Omen, then there's Cameosis and uh, Feel Me. Um, right. These two in 1980, this one's 79. So, um, so Cameosis, that had um, what I thought was like a sequel to I Just Want to Be, which was Shake Your Pants. And um, although personally I liked I Just Want to Be a little better because it was the original, I think Shake Your Pants might have been even a bigger hit. And, you know, even it certainly kept the momentum of the band going big time. Um, and um, we're going out tonight. That was a very cool uh track kind of a mid-tempo and um and you brought back why have i lost you so i don't know how it played out on the east coast but on the west coast it seemed like that song was revived somehow in its second life it became like a big radio hit what what took place there we rarely did songs twice and for some reason, we wanted to do Why Have I Lost You because it had such a great uh, response for a ballad. And the thing about us, we were very funky, and our dance songs and our funk songs were very profound, but as well as our, our ballads were very, uh, even infused that funk sound. Being on the East Coast, we didn't really realize how the West Coast was perceiving us, you know? We didn't really know that until we came out and performed, you know, uh, did shows on the West Coast, but we had no idea what the influence was on uh, out here on this coast. So it was interesting that it was uh, the second Why Have I Lost You was received so well out here. And I guess we did it because we really wanted to expand our range a little bit. You know, we wanted to really say, okay, let's do another one and try to get more, because most of our stuff was on the East Coast. I mean, you know, the, the East Coast, the South, Midwest, 
for the West Coast, we always felt like that's something that had to be conquered. You know what I mean? We, we, we had to we had to really conquer the West Coast. And why have I lost you? Uh, was that one song that we did over, and then when we do it in concert, people would really like it. I mean, even now, still today, we we do shows, and we have to do that song. We have to do that song, even though. Uh, Even though I may be sick of doing it, kind of. <laughs> yeah. But we got to do it, you know. That that's a track that you mentioned your influences. I mean, that really harkens back to like the you know stylistics and Bloodstone and all that kind of like earlier right. '70s kind of soul. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yep. 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 Yeah, I I used to always get frustrated being on the West Coast because that would be like the last place where the tours would come. You know, you guys would tour yeah. like the whole rest of the country and then finally yeah. get to California. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes some of the acts would even drop off the bill before they made it that far. Wow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, they used to say it was because, you know, they want to make sure that they really have it perfected by the time they get out there because the critics are harsher or something. But I don't know if that was true. Yeah, I don't know. It was a weird dynamic, man. It was very strange uh, about that. And, you know, we used to and we used to come out to the West Coast all the time. You know, we used to do shows. But as far as the, the music, we were very interested. I just want to be did great out here. You know, uh, shake your pants. You know, that did great. We're, it, sometimes we do ballads out here and people would know what the heck the song was, you know, what, what was it? They, they went with it. So uh, that was one thing that we wanted to really get over. We wanted to get California. Let's get it. Well, they're already shaking there because of the earthquake. So shake your pants was perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, Feel me. I really like that record. Um, that like first, I think it was first three tracks were all like really funky and um, Keep It Hot was mm -hmm. a monster. And, and I think that one really had a lot of Ohio players influence. Yes. Um, and then the ballad, the title track was really hot too. Yeah. Yeah, Anthony Lockett wrote that as well. Anthony's a very talented singer and songwriter. And when he came, he gave us a different kind of feel. He's from Georgia. So he had like a gospel type of voice, you know, which which gave us a different feel. You know, we're from New York. We're hard. You know, we got the city vibe. And when Anthony came, uh, he gave us that southern gospel -y type of uh, lead vocal. Uh, and he's a hell of a guitar player, too. So, you know, rhythm guitar and all of that. Uh, infused the, our sounds and our songs back then, ballad wise. He he did a, a great job, you know, with that with that with that track. Is it hard to believe now, Tommy, that uh, you know you guys a couple times put out two records in a year, and now it oh. takes like an act of Congress to get a record produced? <laughs> I know, man. I was thinking about that. You know, we used to do two albums a year. You know, we'd come off the road and go right into the studio. You know, our studio was around the corner from Madison Square Garden. So we, you know, we'd have our tour bus and after the tour, we'd pull right into, you know, on 34th Street and right downstairs and start recording because we'd have such, we'd, 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 have, we'd be having such great ideas and, 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 you know, we'd have our little mini cassette recorders and we'd just do stuff with our mouths into the, cassette recorder and you know guys would record guitar stuff on and then we go this is before the days of having studios in your bus you know but back then we, and then we just go record and the pro, uh, proliferation and the the of uh, uh, music that we would come up with we'd have to release two albums in one year you know and now you're right it takes an act of Congress to just get one song five years later, you know, between each, you know, album or whatever it is that they're calling them these days. It's crazy. It's crazy. Well, now our last song, our last album was uh, 
2001 or something. It was, uh, I know we did a live album and then we did one album 2001. I think we're kind of due. Yeah, I would say. But um, um, well, also just the way the machine, you know, the way the machinery works now. But you know, you mentioned about having that great relationship with the label back then, that support, and so the label obviously, I think it was still uh, Casablanca at that point. Um, it was the Chocolate City imprint, but yeah, obviously they were supporting you guys doing as many as two records in one year. Oh yeah, yeah, and they, and back then they had the money, you know. I mean, it was. We were selling records. We were on tour. We were doing great on tour. And we had the support. And that made a lot of difference. That made a big difference in our development through those years, through the 80s. The 80s were very uh, uh, prolific for us. I wanted to um, throw something else at you now that I think is very significant for Cameo. And that's that in the late 70s, early 1980s, it was a rough period for a lot of, for most funk-based bands. Um, I think a lot of them either through their own volition or due to record label pressures, they made artistic concessions, either uh, you know to disco chasing trends and then lost some core following and then were abandoned by their labels. Um, they tried to sound more pop, you know, and they ended up sort of going by the wayside but Cameo, they, you guys navigated, you know, through that really well. And I'm just wondering, you know, what do you attribute that to? And, um, you know, why so many others fail where Cameo succeeded from the 70s to the 80s? One thing that we prided ourselves upon was we would never compromise our, our musical uh, identity. We would never do anything just to appease what was going on at the moment on radio or anything. Now, sometimes that didn't work out, but most times it did. And I think our fans appreciated the fact that we were one of, were one of the acts that you can depend on to be cameo, not anyone else that was coming out or that was popular at the time. And we were able to navigate that. It was a very interesting time, but I think our music reflected the times as well as uh, as well as offered a new take on what was going on. You know, I mean, there was a lot of we've always been very socially aware, very politically aware. Uh, of what was going on at the time and uh, with the government, with with uh, social things that were going on with the drugs and things in New York. And uh, I think that's what really kept us relevant was taking note of those things and bringing those things out in a funky form. And in a form that, you know, it may be, the song may be about one thing, but we'd sneak in a little reference to crack or you know, to Mayor Dinkins or whoever was the mayor at the time, you know, uh, you know, Noriega or, you know, things like that, you know, and talking out the side of your neck was, <clears throat> was one of those songs that uh, very political, very striking, very pointed, and very, very funky and rock. So we weren't afraid to take risks. And thankfully, we keep going back to the times that these records were made. We had the support of the label and radio was open, an open forum to be able to have, you know, to be able to let people and the fans and radio listeners experience these different sounds. So um, that's, that's pretty much what we did. And we just say, hey man, this ball's out. Let's just go, you know, let's just go for it. And that's what we, that was our motto, you know, don't hold back, press that envelope and, and just see what happens, see what happens. You know, you can't be afraid to, uh, 
And I think that's what happens a lot of times, you know, with, and that's what happened with a lot of the groups back then. They were afraid because, you know, the times are changing, music was changing, and sometimes you feel as if, sometimes you feel as if you got to fit in in order to keep the ball rolling. And never like that. Well, that's a big reason why myself and so many others just love the band. Um, you know, and it was around that time, you know, I, I showed this earlier, but um, this cover on the bottom was Knights of the Sound Table, which was 1981. And yes. that is significant. Um, well, I mean, there's some good tracks on it, like, um, um, I mean, what was on this one? Freaky Dancing. Yeah, freaky, freaky dancing. Freaky dance, yeah. and that was that was a jam, and then also uh, you had uh, Nona Hendrix on there, and on, on, on oh, don't, don't be so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I want to ask you how that happened, but um, the point I want to make is that this was the last time we saw, you know, the giant uh, cameo yeah. with like ten band members, and the very yeah. next album, you guys had the back cover had half that many. So we'll talk right. about that in a minute, but I want to ask you, how did you guys uh, get Nona on that one track? Well, we were friends in New York, you know. Back then, we were all, you know, we had, uh, there was Nona and uh, uh, Sheik, you know, Nile and, and, every, and everybody and Luther Vandross, you know, we were all in that New York City community, music. And uh, Nona's manager at the time, we knew very well. And we reached out to her and Nona was more than uh, happy <laughs> to put their vocal, uh, put their vocal thing. And it was very interesting, very nice, very cool the way she did it. And she just fit right in with that, you know? So it was, it was great to have her on the track. Really, really was. It was cool. It was no problem. She was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it, you know? Because I mean, right. cameo cameo had very few guests. That was out of the out of the norm for sure. Right. Yeah. We didn't. We don't really. Have, we didn't really have a lot of guest stars back then. But when, when if you do, I think if you're gonna have a guest star on the record, make it significant or at least. And her part was small. I mean, just the beginning of the, you know, just the spoken word thing at the top of the record, and it was off the chain. She had that attitude. That's what yeah. you needed. Yeah. <laughs> Off the chain, man. All right. So the next year, Alligator Woman came, and, um, you know, you made that change from being the big band with the horns and everything to being more keyboard based and more streamlined, which really was kind of the way of the 80s. But you did it so seamlessly. You know, what happened during that transition, you know, from both a personal standpoint and an artistic sound standpoint? During that time, when you got a big band, sometimes everyone in the band that they would like to be. And when you have, I was just talking about this to some to my daughter actually tonight. She's uh, earlier today. She's she's a singer too, my 18 year old, and she has a she just formed a, a, a group uh, for other young girls in a group. And I was talking to her about how to be careful in a group because it's very difficult when you have uh, other members because egos and different things can be a big issue. And if you have talented people, you're gonna have someone who feels sometimes that their voice isn't being heard or their song isn't being recorded or certain things like that. And we've always put the best songs on a record, no matter who wrote them or who came up with the idea. And uh, so during that time, a couple of the members felt as if they weren't being uh, treated uh, creatively, their creative voices weren't being heard, and they split off and did their own thing, you know, and formed their own band. And we didn't have any there was no hard feelings about it. There was, well, in the beginning, kind of like it was. <laughs> it was a little rough in the beginning. I got to say. 
would you take those instances as you can use them or you can let it destroy you as a band? And what we decided to do was take a whole different uh, musical direction after that. That's when the group pared down to five members. And they said, you know what, let's experiment with a little rock this time. You know, let's get a little edgier. Let's let's revisit those days with, you know, that we had with the ugly ego and uh, sound. Let's, let's go back to that because like I was saying, we all grew up with, with rock groups, you know, Led Zeppelin and you know, we were all grown, we all grew up with with with, it, with that rock sensibility as well as the R and B and the soul and jazz, the whole thing, you know, we were all we all had that. And we thought it'd be great to, you know, let's do something crazy. Let's just do something crazy. So alligator woman were like, okay, who the hell is gonna like this? <laughs> you know, and It's a cameo song. And that's the one thing that we have, we, we've always kept in the forefront of whatever we were doing musically. This is a cameo. This is not, we can do anything we want because we're a band. We can do whatever we want. Let's just do it. And we didn't have any or, or, or expectation of anyone actually playing it or liking it but we knew it felt good to us because this was us. And that's where we presented it and that's where it went. And here, lo and behold, when we're doing the song today or if we don't do it, people are like, hey man, how come you didn't play Alligator Woman? Or, you know, what happened? You know, cause we, were ne we, we never had a concept of region or geographic, uh, ge ge geographical, things we just did the music that cameo does and i think our fans appreciated that because we never compromised on anything and we you can always expect something different okay you come from uh knights of the sound table where you have ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba, you got all these horns and you got this big sound and then you come back down to like a punk act you know and with the next record so that's something that uh, was very interesting and that time period was very uh, uh, significant to our development going forward. Because after that, we never went back to a big band, mm -hmm. never went back. And actually we pared down the horn section and we would, we would bring horns in to record in the studio, but Normally, unless we were doing like big shows or something like that, we 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 eschewed the horns. We didn't we didn't we didn't have them. We we uh, brought two keyboard players in and we do the horns with keyboards. And you know, financially, it was a, it was a a decision financially to do that as well. Uh, but at the same time, to get more of an edgier sound, not so traditional sound. Well, I can tell you, the, I mean, the uh, opening, I mean, just when, just be, um, I just want, wait, just be yourself. Uh, yeah, when that comes on, man, that is just, I mean, it's incredible. And one of my favorite cuts of all time um, with the band, um, you know, when, when that was first laid down in the studio, I mean, you guys must have been getting whiplash from that. That was incredible. That's a Charlie Singleton song right there. Yeah, uh, he came with that idea and very strange, very strange sound. sound the sounds uh, were right then, you know, that electronic rock edgy synth thing was big with us. And we exploited that and be yourself. I didn't realize how big that song was going to be, actually. I didn't really think it was going to do that well, to tell you the truth. I didn't. But uh, I mean, a video we did, I remember a video, we filmed three videos that on that uh, be yourself, flirt, 
and uh, which was another big one. Uh, and uh, gosh, there were three videos we filmed the same time, the same day, because we all had the same clothes on. <laughs> 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 shooting three videos in one day right hmm. and um, it's like the game shows where they do them all like in one day yeah you're right so uh but be yourself was fun man that was that was fun i just didn't think it was going to do what it did you know it's, and sometimes songs are so bizarre that you don't realize that it's going to this song's not going to do anything but you know even now, when we do it on stage. People love it. They love it. Well, and to me, Flirt was kind of one of those tracks, too, because, I mean, it had such unusual uh, keyboard sound and just kind of that bubbling uh, groove to it. You know, I, I heard it and I liked it, but then I heard I, I never really thought they'd pick it up on radio like they did because mm -hmm. it was definitely out there, but, I mean, just a killer groove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flirt was one of those songs, funky. Funky, 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 deep in the funk. That was Flirt. And just, you know, at this period, uh, Alligator Woman style, and uh, she's strange. Alligator Woman, that's yeah. none other than Denise Matthews' later Vanity, right? Exactly. Yeah, that was a fun um, photo shoot. Yeah, it was fun. So... You mentioned, you know, uh, you were surprised by Just Be Yourself, but then with the next album, Style, I mean, that title track was very much in that vein. You know, was that a yeah. conscious effort to kind of continue that vibe? Well, to tell you the truth, Scott, Style was my least favorite album because of that. Because we started to repeat ourselves a little bit. I'm glad to hear you say that because I felt that way, but I didn't want to say it. No, man. It, it was, it, and if you, if you look at the back album cover, you'll see me not smiling. I think I'm the only one on the album that's not smiling. And I'll tell anyone who listens that style was my least favorite. Now, the only song on there that I did like was Your Winner. It was the song that, I, that, that uh, was my favorite. I wrote it but not, not, not because of that, but because uh, it was a positive uh, song that said something. And uh, was meaningful. Yeah, I, I, I felt, you know, style was that one hiccup, you know, that came along for me through a string of great successes, then I was like, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if you got much like feedback from fans on it, but you know, following the band just super close as I did at the time, when it came out, it just was kind of a head scratcher for me. You know? It's yeah. Like, what happened? What are they doing? You know? They, yeah. Yeah. Know. Uh, but it was a yeah. big relief when you came back strong again. But um, I was also curious. Um, you know, why you decided to do a cover of Can't Help Falling in Love? That was, that was the only cover that we've ever done. Yeah. And I think it was kind of nice, actually. I, 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 think it, I think it was kind of nice. I, you may have a different, <laughs> different opinion on that. but No, it was fine. It was just, it was just unusual. Yeah, very unusual. Uh, but I think we did a phenomenal job on that song. And please don't ask me why we did that. I mean... <laughs> I, I did like, I got to tell you though, I, I, I did like on that album, Slow Moving. Slow Moving, yeah, yeah. That was cool, yeah. Now, that, that was, was good. That was like a drunk song, you know what I mean? That was, that was one of those songs when you, you know, you just kind of like, okay, let's just fool around, man, you know? It was, it was, a, it was a definitely a cameo inspired track slow moving you know and one of those songs we could have done earlier on in our career you know it had that kind of really cool minimalistic <laughs> kind of deep groove yeah yeah um so to me the the cameo sound kind of changed again in 1984 with she with uh she's strange and you know you had some rap influence coming in 
you really, you know, MTV videos were getting big at that time and you kind of got a, a, a bigger video presence. And so, mm -hmm. you know, what do you remember of, of that, of that era and how did things change? G strange to me to this day is probably my top cameo song. Uh, and I say that because the experimentation, and I know I've used that word uh, frequently during this interview, but uh, we, the sounds, the drums, I mean, those were, uh, that was a time when uh, Larry was experimenting with the Lynn drum sound, I think it was. Uh, so uh, the electronic drums were very prevalent then. And of course, you, you know, you mentioned the rap. And I think the style of his rap was very apropos to the song. We weren't trying to emulate, but we did uh, New York rap, you know, that was, this was before California, you know, predated California a little bit. Uh, so we were, and in later albums, we also started rapping, even me, uh, to my chagrin, who was rapping. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, in that New York uh, vibe, I think it was smooth, it was cool, and it was perfect for that track. I just loved everything about it. I just loved the sense, the the ethereal uh, nature of the sounds was really, uh, really got me. And uh, the 12 inch version is just, to this day, uh, just takes me places. You know, I mean, it's what, seven, eight minutes long and just like ridiculously beautiful, you know. So that song was very important to me uh, as far as what we were doing. And I think we were back to our creative selves again with that, with that album. Yeah. Um, and it has that, the sounds in it, you know, like the uh, whistle sound from the Spaghetti Westerns that yeah. resurfaced again later. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, Giorgio uh, McCone or somebody yeah. did that. Actually, we ran into his son uh, somewhere along the line. Years later, we ran into his son, and he was telling us that his dad was the one who, you know, created that song for those movies. And we're like, oh, wow, that was, that was pretty deep. That's cool. Make you feel like Clint Eastwood in the yeah. studio a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. So that album also had that track that you mentioned uh, before talking about the side of your neck, which uh, again, I love that, that cut. And, um, you know, I don't think you were necessarily aiming for, for radio with that one. I don't know if you were with any of the tracks cause you were doing them, you know, what your heart told you to do is what we talked about. But, um, you know, was that a track that stood out to you? I mean, obviously it had a powerful message um, sonically. Did you feel that was a little different too? Absolutely, absolutely. That was one of the hardest, hardest uh, in terms of tone, in terms of style uh, that we had done in a while. And the message was even more important to us uh, because how can you be in this world and not see what's going on around you and not, I think a duty as musicians or artists in general is to reflect what's going on in the world and to present it in your style. Like a painter may paint a certain way or uh, a dancer may interpret uh, a dance in a certain way that's, that's uh, reflective of what's going on socially. And musicians have a duty as well. And that time in our political history was insane. So uh, we just told the truth. We just told the truth about it. That's it. You know, the video, very fun, but, uh, you know, with the masks and the different uh, Nixon and, and, and Reagan masks and, uh, and the whole thing. Bush, I don't know if he was even in there, but I don't think he, I think that was before Bush, but um, yeah, that was a hard song. And still today, people love it when we play it because it's just, it's the energy, very energetic very powerful and 
very poignant and had something to say. So what else can you ask about a song? What else can you add to that? Definitely. I think it goes back to, you know, cuts like You Haven't Done Nothing by Stevie Wonder, which, you know, that one and this one, I mean, unfortunately, I think are more relevant today than, than they were then, you know, which is how things go, I guess. Right. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, probably back then, we were so naive, thought it wouldn't be that way 30 years later, but here we are. Hey, man, we say the same thing about Skin I mean, when we did that. Now we, we do that on stage now, and, and it's a shame. It's a damn shame that just nothing has changed. And still, from then, you know, you're doing songs that reflected the time then and still today. It's, it's crazy. That's why you got to keep on keeping on with it. Exactly. Um <clears throat> So in 1985, after that big She's Strange uh, artistic and commercial success, uh, you came back with Single Life, and that also um, was a hit. And now we're in the stretch where there was a Single Life. Yeah. Um, and to me, the highlight of that one was Attack Me With Your Love. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, but that was, I think, if not the best, one of the best sort of mid-tempo cameo tracks. Mm -hmm. That's a fun song, and I say I use that word too. But you know, that's those are the words that, in you know, those, those are the words when you talk about cameo, fun, uh, experimental, uh, 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 rockish, uh, creative. You know, those those words uh, come up a lot. Uh, Attack me with your love was was very cool because. It's kind of like uh, we all uh, um, in that uh, in that uh, airy uh, popish type of uh, fun song, you know, and uh, yeah, and the video was fun too, you know. I think we 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 had a. Uh, uh, um, a little Xavion Glover, uh, young Xavion Glover in there, and uh, one of the uh, the brothers. Oh gosh, I can't. I don't want to think. I don't want to make any mistakes. We had a few people in there, and along with the video. I think the video was uh, with Debbie Morgan and and uh, the guys, the guy from the soap operas. You know, we were we started to get into a little celebrity uh, type of uh, rubbing vibe elbows with the video. With the, yeah, with the videos, you know, and and that was cool, you know. That was oh Heinz, yeah, one of the Heinz brothers, uh, 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 tap dancing. Uh, so we had that in there, and it was very good. And I guess the sequel to that would have been uh, Single Life. Uh, it was almost like a almost a maybe a trilogy, uh, video wise, but. The Attack Me With Your Love was very nice. And another one of the songs that I wouldn't think, that I didn't think would do as well, because people responding so well to our more aggressive music so well, that when we did songs like that, it, it, uh, it, it really surprised us that they would be received so well. Uh, you understand? So, but Attack Me was a great song. And when we play it on stage, people love it because it does offer a, on a, an alternative, a different kind of cameo vibe to, to you know, to the, uh, uh, the other rockish stuff we do. And then, of course, it set the stage for the, the monster breakthrough, 1986, Word Up. Um, yeah. Yeah, that album had uh, not only Word Up, but also uh, Candy, Back and Forth. Um, you know, I think it, I had long known and heard, you know, Larry's, you know, Owl, you know, which is kind of like a, I can't do it like he does it, but kind of like a throwback to Sugarfoot, the hot players. And that became yeah. such like a, a trademark, widely known thing at that point. And I mean, Cameo just blew up. So, yeah. Um, you know, that was a whole new level of celebrity and fame. There's a, a album cover there, which actually only has three of you guys on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, me, Nate, and Larry. Nat and Larry, yeah. So, yeah. Well, at that point, oh, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you, 
I was going to say, just just talk about that. I mean, did you ever imagine? Uh, I'm sure you didn't. That it would blow up like that, and and you know, how did you res respond to it, and how did the band respond to it? Uh, no, we knew it was a good song, Scott, and we knew that it was a combination of all the 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 uh, the musical influences that we all brought to the table from 1977. You know, we had, you know, that funk and that rock were important. And at that point, we decided to emphasize that a little more in our music. And uh, Word Up was interesting because the record label didn't want to release it after we recorded it. Uh, I think we were at Polygram at the time. And after we recorded the song, there's a big meeting and, you know, we talked about releases and was this going to come out and they didn't want to release it until uh, another polygram executive from England told them, if you don't release this song, you're crazy. So better heads prevailed and it turned out to be the biggest song we ever had. Did someone get fired? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, since it was the boss, I don't know if he got fired, but I know he's no longer with Polygram, and Polygram, who knows what's going on with them. But I say that to say, uh, luckily, there are some executives in this world who uh, have sense and could see that this song was a unique very unique song that set the table for many songs to come after that. And sound wise, uh, it was sonically different. You wouldn't think that a song like Word Up would be as popular as it was actually uh, for radio at that time. But I think it was the, uh, the the essence of what Cameo was at that time. Perfect song for the 80s, the late 80s, right before hip hop and rap came into, uh, came into kind of like Bosh on all that, you know, on, on stuff that we were doing, you know. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was interesting. And another interesting story, uh, of how the uh, infamous Red Cup came about because that also was introduced during that Word Up uh, period. As you know, it wasn't seen prior to that. Uh, while we were filming the video, well, actually filming the video, we had a clothing, clothing designer uh, named Toyce Anderson who uh, was with us at the time and he came into the video shoot with a box and he said to Larry, he said, Larry, check this out. And because we knew Toys was always coming up with some crazy. So he opened the box and here's this boxing cup. This is red thing in this box. He said, man, you got to check this out. Larry was like, hell no, I'm not wearing that. So man, just try it, just try it, just, you never know. So he said, all right, you know, we were always open for something crazy, you know, that's, your music will tell you that, we was always open for something a little different. So he tried it on, did the video, the rest is history. Now you can't get him out of the damn thing, you know? <laughs> I hope he has more than one now. <laughs> <laughs> well, back then, you know, with, uh, with a lot of other releases that we had, we had white ones, we had black ones, you know, he had a black one, a white one, red, you know, now it's just the red, just the red one, yeah. That's it. I'm trying to get him out of it, Scott. I'm telling you, man, I'm trying to get him out of it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, not so you can wear it, right? Hell no. <laughs>